So we are back talking about million dollar careers. Um, I've got my, my good friend, Rob Houghton with me as always. Um, Rob is sitting in Abu Dhabi this week. Um, he's over there on business for a couple of weeks. And uh, what's happening over in the Emirates, Rob? It's all good here. Nothing much changes. It's a great country, great people. 126 degrees today, but they tell Oof. me, Rob, it's a dry heat. I'm like, it's a, okay. Can you imagine? I can't imagine 126 degrees. And that was in the oh, shade. So if you were if you were crazy enough to get out of the shade, I think I think the heat index 137. Oh, wow. That's I'm uh, continually wow. just hydrating all the time. I can only imagine. Can I've got to be out in the desert uh, for a half a day tomorrow, and uh, I must have drank you know three or four gallons of water with electrolytes. It's, it's crazy. I believe it. I believe it. So cool. But, uh, well, hey, we are talking. Here. We're going to get out of the desert. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk tugboats and big ships today. Tugboat oh, great, theory. man. Good. So I've read. You talking about barges too? Uh, with tugboats and big ships. No barges. Just tugboats right. and big ships. And uh, yeah. and I've written about this on a couple blogs a lot, and I talk about it a lot. And um, you know, it recently came up. What it came up. You know, uh, again. You know, last week with a fella I was talking to and. He's been a small company guy and he's trying to figure out where he fits into a big company and the big companies are kind of holding them off. And, you know, I talked to him about tugboats. It's like, you're a, you're a tugboat guy. You're not a big ship guy. Yeah. And you got to know the difference. Um, so, you know, with all that's being around about, let's just talk about it a little bit. When I talk about tugboat theory, it's this. It started out several years ago. And I had a search for the president of a small $20 million company. Mm -hmm. And I took it to a guy who was looking to do something new, but I think he was out of Honeywell or Eaton or one of the big companies at the time. He was a general manager. And he says, $20 million, that's too small for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I get it. And then it just so happened, that's what it dawned on me. I so happened the next day I was down on the river with Manny. Savannah River. And uh, I was watching two tugboats take a, a big container ship out of the harbor. Anybody that's yeah. ever seen the Port of Savannah, you know, Savannah River is about 20 miles long, empties into the Atlantic. And it's one of the biggest East Coast ports in the world. And this yeah. thousand foot long container ship had two tugboats, you know, nursing it out of the harbor. And that's when I started thinking about tugboat captains versus big boat captains. The tugboat captain is doing his job on a 75 foot work boat with a crew of four. So it's small, but he deals with shifting tides, you know, all you know, shifting tides and shifting currents. Nothing's really the same. He's pushing big boats into harbor, into port. He's taking big boats out of port. I'm like, he's a busy guy. And then I started thinking about the captain of that big thousand foot ship. And that big thousand foot ship captain, all he's got to do is sit there. The, you know, the tugboats pull him out of port. The harbor pilot takes him up river. He takes over command of his boat when it's out somewhere out in the open ocean. And all he does is put it on auto autopilot. And he's on autopilot until, you know, he's in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, small course changes. He's not doing anything drastic. It's just small course changes. And I thought about, you know, look at that tugboat captain. You could sit there and say, hey, look, you've only commanded a small boat, but there's a lot going on there. And that guy makes a lot of money too. Yeah. And you so, know, that guy that's on the big boat, he's probably sitting there eating a ham sandwich, sit, sitting in a catbird seat. That's all they do. They're on autopilot the whole way. You know, they have a crew of 26, 27 people, a lot of deck hands. He's got a chief in, you know, but the bottom line is that 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 captain of that boat, his routes are already pre-planned for him. He knows where he's going months in advance. But you know that uh that captain on on that big ship has has a lot of important, you know. He's got a very important job. He's got a lot of responsibilities. I think, you know, 
comparing him or contrasting him with the tugboat guy is sort of like comparing the CEO of a Fortune 500 to an entrepreneur of a small company in that the ship captain is an analogous to uh, to the CEO because you know that ship captain he's the face of that ship right as the CEO is the face of the organization he's his his skills are mutually exclusive to a large degree from the tugboat guy because he's more of a process he's got his playbook he has his control panel he has a series of steps there's a real hierarchy in in whatever he does he's playing defense you know what i mean mm -hmm. Absolutely. you got the tugboat guy he's like the guy that's running his own company shifting winds shifting sands shifting tides he's got to be the jack of all trades he's got to have that you know that fighting spirit the ability to critically think think on his feet Totally different skill set. Absolutely, yeah. No, I was watching uh, totally David. Agree. Who is it? David Bernstein. Is it? Uh, is it David Carlisle, the CEO of Carlisle, the big or not Carlisle? Oh, yeah. yeah, Carlisle, the big guy. He was uh, interviewing uh, Phoebe uh, Novakovich. I watched oh, really? an interview with Phoebe Novakovich, and Phoebe is the CEO of General Dynamics. Yeah, brilliant lady. I mean, she's done. You know, she's she's great. You she, you could hear the way she talks, and she's a brilliant lady really really smart you know and she hey, knows how she down. knows how to run a multi-billion dollar multi-division fortune yeah. 50 right. company she probably would not do well as an entrepreneur of a small right. business you know of a yeah. small business two totally different skill sets you know yes. and and on the on the flip side you take the entrepreneur of a small business you know, they're probably not going to be the best at running a big company. And I think what I talk about the tugboat theory is, you know, is understanding who you are as a person. Yes. Okay. Understanding who you are as a person. You know, there are people who are real, who would, there are people who would really do better in small companies drowning in big ones because they don't understand that, you know, you know, they, they, they know they want more. They know they want something different. They know they've got this entrepreneurial spirit inside them. And that is continually being held back inside a big company because, you know, big companies don't want really or need entrepreneurs. Yeah. Whereas they already have a process. It's like a business in a box, you know, correct. you come in, here's the business in a box. Here's the playbook. Here's the rules. Right. Don't violate it. Yeah. Get along to go along, which is fine. If you're a big company, because a big company like a General Electric or a General Dynamics is like that ocean liner steaming through the North Atlantic, breaking through icebreakers. Two degrees of is very difficult two, to do. Two de you're going to make one or two degrees of course corrections along the way, and that's <laughs> that's all you're going to do. You know, you're you're not. You know, that's it. Exactly. Um, and 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 look, when I you know companies like Lockheed Martin, you know, you're not going to be an entrepreneur in Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin, rightfully so, does not want entrepreneurs right. because, you know, they got secrets, government contracts, black programs, highly specialized, you know, things under development. And, they, and what they don't need is somebody coming in who can't understand the process or wants to change the process, putting their business at jeopardy because... Yeah. They want to be out there. And this gets into a lot of other areas that we've already talked to, such as coaching. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, an individual has to reach that, you know, self-realization in their professional careers, mm -hmm. as well as their personal lives to know who they are. Like, what am I good at? Am I an right. entrepreneur or am I more of a corporate guy? Right. A lot of people never really come to grips with that. But for, for those that do and make the course correction, you can be very, very successful. Absolutely. You know, or you think about like, you know, for instance, though, you know, how good are you? Do you want to see how good you really are as a business person? Go run a small business. Go take over a $20 million manufacturing facility. Yeah. You know, you may be great at GE or Honeywell or 
Eaton Corporation or wherever, but take yourself out of that environment where you're now running, you're now charged with growing a $20 million business with a hundred people. And you're like, okay, yeah. go double it. Now we're going to figure out how good you are. Yeah. And, and that is the true test of, you know, that's the two that, that becomes the true test. I think, you know, the reverse is true. I remember a long, long time ago, I went from a small, small organization to a huge organization, Cable and Wireless. Mm -hmm. And Jack Kennedy will tell you about my experiences with Cable and Wireless. Cable and Wireless was so freaking unglued and incompetent. Yep. They, they were literally hemorrhaging a couple of billion dollars a month or a year. I mean, you talk about incompetency, it, it, it was criminal, you know, how mm -hmm. the incompetency at the highest levels. I remember I got a job there and um, I, 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 I remember going through my work as a, as a program manager, thinking to myself, I could do this job in like 90 minutes. What the hell else am I going to do for the other six and a half hours a day? You know? Yep. And there was a, a bunch of us in our department, people that I was managing, okay? I had like five or six people under me. <laughs> we somehow discovered that in the bowels of the parking garage in our office building, a janitor had a key to a gymnasium that had a basketball court. And for some reason, nobody, nobody knew this. So we used to get our work done in the mornings and afternoon after lunch, mm -hmm. we'd all check out and we, we, we go play full court basketball for most of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. we, we get all of our work done. And I remember thinking to myself, what kind of a person would ever want to work in a corporate job like this? But I will tell you, there were people in that organization who rose to the top mm -hmm. that weren't nearly as smart as our team. And the reason was, was because they were really good at operating within a hierarchical organization. They were really good about bureaucracy. They were really, really good about how, how to handle themselves in meetings. Mm -hmm. They're really good about networking. They're really good about, you know, they had a really good political sense as to where the winds were blowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people were actually very, very savvy people in a corporate way. Yep. That was completely foreign to how I had ever operated in any organization. And, and like you said, I was a fish out of water. After like nine months, I was making a lot of money. And I said, I'm not a corporate guy. Yep. I just, I just couldn't survive. I knew I was an entrepreneur. And then I started my recruiting business. Yeah. You know, my first, my, the, the company, huh? the first company I, <laughs> the first company I went to work with after the Navy, it was, you know, I got bored. It was like literally, you know, yeah. the, the stay in your lane. This is your job. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Yeah. Don't move, you know, don't move too far left. Don't move too far right. You know, look, it's, it's their gig. Okay. You know, it's their rules. It's their game. It's, their, yeah. you, I would literally take off at 11 o'clock in the morning and I'd go hit golf balls till one. Yeah. And then I come back and it's like, okay, I got my stuff done, you know, but I'm taking two hours in between. And I'm going to go hit golf balls. And I did. And then I think it was one of those times hitting golf balls. It was like, you can't just do it. you. You got to you know because what it does is it starts to eat you. When you're the yeah. when yeah. you're the right person in the wrong environment, it starts to mess with your head. Well, you know what it's like. It's like it's like driving a car down a highway, and your fender is hanging off. Yeah, and it and it's creating friction with the road, and you can see all the sparks. Yeah, that's what it's like. It. it it's, it's not a good position for anybody to be in. Yeah. And that's why one of my principles has always been, uh, like particularly if I'm consulting for the military or something, if I find myself not at 110% passionate mm -hmm. about what I'm doing, if I'm not like totally in, into the guys, the NCOs that I'm training, mm -hmm. if I'm in that situation, I'll go to the commanding officer and tell him, you know, yep. I'm not doing this rotation anymore because I'm just, 
I'm basically stealing your money from you. If I'm not 100 percent into it, I, I'm not doing mm -hmm. it. Right. But but then the you know it comes yeah, down do it. to yeah, but it comes down to this. It's not just that. It's it's a function of you know, if you really want to thrive in your career, people who want to thrive in their careers need to understand eventually, you know, they they gotta they gotta come to the understanding as to who they are as people. And they gotta be thinking about like, you know, in the case of this fellow, you know, I was trading some emails with earlier in the week. I was like, you're 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 a small company guy. You know, you were, you were leading, you owned a small business, you were leading a small business. If you're going to the big companies, they're looking at you going, you're not going to fit in here. Yeah. Right. You know, you're going to drown. You're going to get bored. You're going to drown. We know it. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's like, it's like the tugboat captain going to the Wilhelmsen line. You know, you're a small company. You're a tugboat captain. You're not going to do well here on autopilot. Yeah. And um, yeah. You know, I, I think your point's right. It you know, I think the whole point here is that people should really spend the time to reflect upon who they are, mm -hmm. and then put themselves in a position, whether it be the corporate big ship or if they want to be the entrepreneur on the tugboat. Mm -hmm. Because once you spend that kind of time, investing time in like really reflecting and 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 thinking about like who am I, what do I want to do then you can put yourself on the fast track. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it's not necessarily the big ship is right or wrong or the tugboat's right or wrong. They're just two different boats, that's all. You know? Right. It's, there's, no wrong, there's no wrong answer. It's the best. You know, I think there's a, a buddy of mine out there. His name's Scott Ashton. And Scott, he's probably listening to this. He run, He bought a company. So Scott was a big company guy. And then, you know, uh, you know, Big company decided they wanted to close up his PL. He's not there anymore. He, you know, wanders across the desert for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity came his way and he jumped on it. And that was to go buy this little business called Aerox. And every time I talk to Scott, probably half a dozen times a year, man, he's he's killing it. Yeah. He's killing it. He's happy. He's putting his, you know, he's got his operations experience he's putting to use. He's got his marketing experience he's putting to use. He's got his general management experience he's putting to yeah. use. Yeah. And he realizes, hey, I got all these skills that I learned in the big company. Now I'm putting them to use to grow my own little company. And he just acquired another competitor of his and he's growing and he's doing great. But, you know, going from that big company atmosphere to running your own thing, that's a scary adventure. That would be my question is, do you think it's easier for an entrepreneur to go work in a big company or, or vice versa? What do you think? I think it's really easy. If you're a talented person who's really learned process, who's really learned, you know, look, some of the big companies like GE is, you know, GE has been known since, you know, for the last 40 years is a great, you know, is a great building ground for really yeah. talented executives. You know, and, and and quite frankly, the blow up of GE, this debacle that is now GE, I do not fault any of the people inside the company at all because they're actually really good and they're actually really frustrated yeah. as to what's going on. Yeah. I think when they learn when they learn the processes and they learn the procedures and they learn how to do things well and grow people and they step into small businesses very easily. I think they've got the skills. Honeywell, yeah. the same. And obviously, you know, your insurance guys, kind of the same. I think it's about the opposite, though? I think that it's very hard. Entrepreneur doing it. I think it's very hard for an entrepreneur to step out of entrepreneurship and go to a big company. Is it because they... They lose that freedom because it's like once you have the freedom of movement, the yeah. freedom of thought, it's difficult to give that back. I, I would think. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It's it's it becomes a why won't they let me? Why don't they trust me? I've done this before a thousand times in my own business, and it's a different. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a different gig, right? It's a different. Gig. I know in the military, you know, you, you very seldom hear of a special ops guy, which is the equivalent of an entrepreneur, you know. 
uh, being successful going into the officer corps or even just going back into big military. But the opposite, uh, the opposite happens. You have people going from like 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne, 10th Mountain Division into special operations, mm -hmm. and they're typically successful. You know. Yeah, but you take you can you can you can. It, it just doesn't work. It doesn't necessarily go both ways. Exactly. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I've known so, more. The first thing I've talked to a lot of private equity people, and they're like, "We're going to go buy this business." I'm like, okay, what are you going to do with the founder? Yeah. Well, we're going to keep him around for a little while. I'm like, well, I don't know. Just buy him out. Let him go. Her go. Because it just, it's going to create friction that you don't necessarily I, want or need. When I sold uh, my company, Geopath.net in 1999 to Robert Friedland, a billionaire, first thing Friedland said is, first thing we got to do, Rob, is fire you as a CEO, because you're the founder, we got to bring in a professional CEO. Right. And uh, it took him like 30 seconds to explain it. I'm like, yeah, you're right. If we want to really drive value in this company, mm -hmm. I, I got to step down and bring a professional CEO you know, yep. in with executive experience, because I was not an executive management guy. I was a guy that showed up in Nairobi with a couple of suitcases full of telecoms, equipment, and antennas, mm -hmm. and ended up uh, building a business but that's not what a ceo does no no ceo is it's a it's a totally different skill set i remember there was a there was a company i was involved in and oh, probably about five, four or five years ago and private equity group bought it they had no they, they had no business buying it because they had no idea what the business was about um the founder stayed on and the longer he stayed and saw what they were doing to his business the more frustrated he got and then the more frustrated he got, you know, of course, he still sits on the board. Yeah. The more rocks he started throwing in the machinery, which then pissed them off. It was not a good fit. Yeah. It was first not thing I do. Fit. First thing you have to do is fire the founder. Yeah. So that's a, that's a little bit of, you know, that's, that's, but, but, you know, I was talking to, you know, it, it all came down to, I was having this conversation again. I always feel like big ships and little ships. There's different. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that I always try and take this down to the level of, so, how, so what kind of, what would a young person at a college building his career take away from this conversation? I'm thinking maybe what it is, and, you, and I, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Maybe what it is, is for somebody that, that wants a career at a college, at a business school, maybe, maybe you go to a big firm first for three to five years like a McKinsey or a General Dynamics or a GE, learn the professionalism that, that exists in the business world and then learn all those skills, learn how to handle yourself and then go for the small company as opposed to coming out of college and trying to be an entrepreneur. Well, yeah. And, well, it's the same thing for transitioning military people. Yeah. And, and the, 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 um, the fallacy of their argument going inside their head is that they have to eat the apple all in one bite. I have to make the right career move now. Exactly. Because they think this is whatever I do now will be forever etched in stone. And the answer is that's not true. Yeah. You know, kid coming out of college, 22 years old. You know, if you're finance, if you're a, if you're a kid, who studied finance in college, your goal is to understand in three years, finance really, really well, sales really, really well, marketing really, whatever your, whatever mm -hmm. the job is, you know, you learn a skill set. And then you learn a new skill set and you learn as much as you can. And then when that company doesn't give you scratch your itch anymore, you move, you leave, you go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing with the military guy. You're getting out of the military. All right. You go find a company where you can go work <laughs> and be happy for a few years and learn some skills. And as long as you're learning skills and you're doing good things at that company, you stick around the minute you capped out. Yeah. 
It's, it's, you, yeah. you know, you, your, your ultimate career success might be happening in three or four bites, not one. Yeah, that's why I see people that stay in a job for more than about seven years. It's, it's usually not a good uh, career move. You know, I counsel people three to seven years is that window that you want to make a move. Three to four years with positive progression. Exactly. Is the way I look at it. You know, the person, how many times have you gotten a resume from somebody who's been in a company for 30 years and they're kind of at a, they're a 30 year vice president in one company. And they're like, well, I want to go do something. I want to go move. I want to go do something different now. Really? Ooh, yeah. ooh, it's tough. Yeah. You stayed too long. Yeah. You stayed too long. Cause now, you know, people are going to go, why does he want to leave? What happened? What happened? Why do they want to leave? Ooh, are they too? Are they too? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Are you they said too that. Acme Corporation? The only, had a, yeah, yeah. It's 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 the maker of anvils at Acme Corporation. Does he not have, make anything other than anvils and hunt coyotes? You know? I had a lady that has thirty-one years of experience. Now, okay. She started in, in this company when she was 18, in high, right out of high school. So she's still 49 years old, which is, is still pretty young. I mean, you're in your prime, 49 years old, but she's been there for 31 years. I presented her to a client. She's a fantastic uh, individual. The, along the same lines as you just suggested, you know what the guy told me? He says, hey, Rob, I'm, I'm looking at this resume, 31 years. Why all of a sudden now? Did she get caught stealing or something? Yeah, I, I, that's a, I, That's the thing that came to his mind. So, like she, something must have happened. It's not mm -hmm. like did she get caught stealing? I said no, I don't. She get caught stealing. She's just wants to make a move. Well, what happened after thirty one years? So, so, so you're right. Man. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough conversation to have because then all of a sudden now you're talking. You're on defense. Yeah. Yeah, you're not expect you're not you're not talking about the greatness. You're trying to convince them why. It's not, you know, it's it's not, you know, hey, try this. It's it's awesome. It's hey man, you you know, be like Mikey, you know. Mikey eats everything. And if I if Mikey, Mikey. eat it, you, you should Mikey. too, right? Remember that the commercial? Mikey weighs about 400 pounds now, by the way. Yeah. You might. Yes. Hey, uh, have you ever been on a tugboat before? I have been. So my father, uh, he was a grocer. Okay, mm -hmm. worked on the, worked on an AMP store. In in Albany, on the Hudson River side. Okay, okay. so his store, his store was near the Hudson River, and uh, a guy on a tugboat, a captain, used to come in all the time and get his supplies because he would head down in New York City and then he'd come back. So he would come in like once every couple of weeks. His name was Richie. And he, he became such good friends with Richie, he'd bring Richie over to the house every once in a while. And Richie was a real man's man. We, you know, cut off T-shirts, sleeveless, mm -hmm. crew cut. Uh, and apparently he was one of the best tugboat captains on the Hudson River. Uh, but he was a rough character. Been married four or five times or something. And he was an Oakland A's baseball fan. And uh, for his birthday, my dad bought three tickets for the Yankees Oakland A's baseball game down in Yankee Stadium. Right. And I had only met Richie a couple of times. That Richie was like a legend around the dinner table at night because my father would have all these crazy stories about Richie did this, Richie did that. He was just a real wild man. You talk about an entrepreneur. I mean, this guy would have survived in a corporate environment in like five minutes and probably been terminated. So this very colorful guy, big guy, a six, five, about two fifty, crew cut shows up at our house and we drive down to, to New York city, about a two and a half hour drive from Albany and Richie's joking around and telling tugboat stories and all that stuff. So we finally get to Yankee stadium, Yankees and Oakland A's, right? So he's got his Oakland A's, baseball cap on and Richie in the first inning of the game one of these hot Sunday afternoons 
starts drinking. And you can see this colorful character coming to life before my eyes. And I was like a seven-year-old kid. You know? mm -hmm. And he's swearing, throwing F-bombs around. And my father's just kind of going along with it. And he's flirting with all the women. And it's just, this is like this tugboat guy, you know, rough. Yep. And I never forget this. My dad and I excuse ourselves. And we go up to the hot dog stand, Yankee Stadium. We bought a bunch of hot dogs, a couple of beers and a Coke for me. And as we're walking back down to the first deck, I see this crowd of people in the general area that we were sitting. And I see these arms flailing along. And Richie was in a fight with like 15 guys. He had a shirt ripped right off of his back. And he was just like taking on all comers. He was hitting, it was like a pinball machine. He hit a guy and, and, and knock him like three rows back. He hit another guy, knock him silly. And by the time I got down there, there was all these New York policemen came down, handcuffed Richie and escorted him out of the stadium. Right, right. So we watched the rest of the game and Richie was in a bar somewhere a couple of streets away, you know, from the Yankee Stadium. So that's my story about it. So here's Richie, the captain. Richie, man. the tugboat Richie. captain would not do well in IBM, which required everybody wear <laughs> gray, gray pinstripe suits. And uh, you remember white exactly. shirts, gray pinstripe suits. And uh, right. You know. Richie wore a baseball cap backwards before it was fashionable yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah but that's ultimately where I'm, that that ultimately is, it, it just kind of comes to yeah. it i mean i i think we've we've kind of we've we've kind of hit the subject it's understanding who you are yeah and richie knew exactly who he was yeah, yeah and if you're not a cubicle person don't go to a, you know don't go to a company where you're in a cubicle and if you're not you know if you're not willing to you know live every day where you're you know you're <laughs> Chief cook, bottle washer, and taking out the trash too. Yeah, you know, maybe that small company is not for you. Yeah, you know, Richie was like that too. You know, he was the cook. Yeah, he was the navigator on the boat. He supervised yeah. people. And you know what? My dad still talks about Richie. He was the best damn tugboat captain on the Hudson River. Yeah. So yeah, but that highly skilled guy in the right, you know, highly skilled guy in a certain environment. But you know, at the end of the day, I think it's it's all about look. Everybody brings skills to the table. You know, you have big company skills, small company skills. You got to know where you sit somewhere in between and understand if you're really at heart, a small company person, don't go looking for jobs inside big companies. You're going to find mm -hmm. a lot of resistance. You know, they're not going to hire you. You're going to find a lot of resistance there. And if they do hire you, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to understand why. And then, you know, the same thing is, but for the big company people that really understand, you know, they've understand the processes or whatever else, you know, the small companies offer a lot of opportunity. You know, they're, they're, they can be scary, but there's plenty of opportunity there too, if for those willing to take it. So yeah. it's all good. There's nothing like going into an organization and being able to build and grow something to fruition. It's sort of like being an artist, a painter, a poet, a sculptor. You're literally building and growing something that's yours. Mm -hmm. And that's what being a tugboat captain is in a small entrepreneurial organization. Absolutely. How do people get a hold of you, Rob? Well, it'd be difficult to get a hold of me now because I'm in Abu Dhabi. I'm eight hours in front of the East Coast, but... Uh, you know, people can always email me at rob at mrfairfax.com. I'm all over social media, LinkedIn, YouTube, podcasts, blogs, you name it. Um, but yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me, Craig, is rob at mrfairfax.com. Love your blog. And thanks Rob. for having me on the show, man. As always. Enjoy it, man. Tugboats and big ships, man. Travel safe. Talk soon. All right. Thanks, Craig. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.